Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome. I'm Adam Siegler and I'm the president of the Beverly Hills Bar Association. This evening, we are honored to host this public debate between the two candidates for the office of Los Angeles County District Attorney. This is an important race in an important election year with many important issues which are even now in the news. And as befitting the, the topic and the candidates, we have over 850 guests already pre-registered and many, many more who will be attending. Uh, as we take our seats in our virtual auditorium to get the program underway, I just wanted to give a quick technical note. When you're using Zoom, you should be in your gallery mode view. So if you've not selected that, please do so. Also, if for any reason we should experience any technical issues, we have a crack tech team standing by from Beverly Hills Bar. So just give us a minute to reestablish contact if we lose anybody or you don't hear the audio. So don't, don't leave your seats if for any reason there's any interruption. I just wanna say a note about our sponsor and host, and we start with the Beverly Hills Bar Association. Many of you know we were founded in 1931, in part to provide a forum for lawyers who found themselves excluded from other organizations. And since that time, our bar and its foundation have been a progressive force for the rule of law, for the fair treatment of all people under the law, and for the provision of free legal services to those most in need. And as part of our focus on inclusion, we are very much honored this evening to include a number of other uh, co-sponsors for this event. And I wanna identify each one of them individually to acknowledge them. The first is the John M. Langston Bar Association of the Los Angeles, California. The second is the Mexican American Bar Association, the Asian Pacific American Bar Association, the Italian American Lawyers Association, the Consumer Attorneys Association of Los Angeles and of California, and finally, our sister organization, the Los Angeles County Bar Association Criminal Justice Section. It's important to have all of these voices at our table and reflected in our conversation this evening, and we're honored that we have so many sponsors and so many visitors and attendees and viewers for this important debate. Let me take a moment to introduce the candidates very briefly. They have long and distinguished resumes, but I'll just hit the high points so that we have in mind who they are and, and how they come to this job. First is the incumbent, DA Jackie Lacey. She was born in Los Angeles and raised in the Crenshaw neighborhood. In 1979, she received her BA from the University of California in Irvine with a degree in psychology. And in 1982, she graduated from the University of Southern California Law School. In 1986, DA Lacey joined the district attorney's office as a deputy district attorney, and she worked her way up through the ranks, taking on management and executive roles in the DA's office in 2000. In 2011, DA Lacey was named as the chief deputy district attorney, which is the second in command to the DA. And finally, in 2012, she was elected as the DA and she was sworn in as the Los Angeles County District Attorney on December 3, 2012. Our, our uh, challenger, DA George Gascon, immigrated from Havana, Cuba in 1967. And in 1972, he joined the U.S. Army and was promoted to sergeant. In 1978, he started to work at the Los Angeles Police Department, first as a patrol officer and working his way up to become assistant chief. He has a Bachelor's of Art in History from Cal State Long Beach. And in 1996, DA Gascon received his JD degree from the Western State College of Law. In 2006, Mr. Gascon became the Chief of Police in Mesa, Arizona. In 2009, he became the Chief of Police in San Francisco. I believe he was appointed by then Mayor Gavin Newsom. And finally, in 2011, he was appointed as the San Francisco District Attorney. Now at this point, there are many, many other achievements and awards that both of these candidates have received that I could mention. But I think my role here is to maintain a studious neutrality. And so I will leave all of their many policies and initiatives for the debate itself. But I would like to say this about both our candidates. I think it is safe to say that both of these candidates have had a long and distinguished career in public service and particularly in the administration of justice. And both of these candidates have proven that they can work their way up 
through education and hard work to achieve the highest ranks in the administration of, of justice. So we are honored to have both of these candidates with us here this evening. And now let me turn to the moderator. And here I am allowed to have a distinct bias and preference. I think we have exactly the right moderator for this debate. Uh, our moderator this evening will be Professor Beth Colgan, who is a professor at law at UCLA School of Law. She has a BA from Stanford in 1995 and graduated from the Northwestern School of Law. After teaching at Stanford, she went to UCLA and teaches criminal and constitutional law there. Professor Colgan is one of the country's leading experts on constitutional and policy issues relating to economic sanctions as punishment and particularly for the lawyers in the audience on the Eighth Amendment Successive Fines Clause. She also researches the treatment of juveniles and indigent people in the justice system. At this point, I would pause just to note that I hope that her students are watching because all of this material will be on the final exam. And last thing I will say is that I myself am a perpetual student of the law. So I think at this juncture, I will sit quietly in my chair and turn over the proceedings to Professor Colgan. Colgan, Professor Colgan, you have charge of the proceedings and you have the floor, welcome. Thank you very much. It's my honor to be here tonight to moderate this debate. We'll begin momentarily, uh, but I'd like to uh, describe to the audience the rules of the debate. We'll begin with opening statements. Mr. Gascon will go first and Ms. Lacey will go second. Based on a coin flip, Ms. Lacey will then be asked the first question in the debate. Both candidates will have 90 seconds to respond to each question. As moderator, it will be in my discretion to ask for further response and to provide time for rebuttal. I have advised both campaigns that it is preferable for the candidates to focus on affirmative responses regarding their own policies and practices rather than negative responses directed toward their opponent because that'll allow us to spend more time, less time on rebuttal, which will in turn allow us to spend more time on the topics at hand. In advance of the debate, audience members were provided an opportunity to submit questions. The response was substantial, which is indicative of the high level of interest in this election. Unfortunately, it also means we will be unable to address all of the submitted questions in the time allotted for tonight's debate. I would encourage voters to direct any questions we do not reach directly to the campaigns. To that end, the Beverly Hills Bar Association is providing contact information for both campaigns in the chat dialog box and will include it again at the end of the evening. After the questioning period, both candidates will be able to provide closing remarks. At that time, Ms. Lazy will begin and Mr. Gascon will go second. And with that, let us begin. Our first question tonight focuses on an issue of grave importance nationally and here in Los Angeles, the use of deadly and excessive force by law enforcement. Both of our candidates have been the subject of heavy criticism about their handling of deadly and excessive force cases. The law, however, has recently changed. In 2019, California Governor Gavin Newsom signed into law Assembly Bill 392, which set new standards for use of force cases. The bill states that officers may use objectively reasonable force to effect arrest, to prevent escape, or to overcome resistance, and further states that officers may only use deadly force under the following circumstances to defend against imminent threat or of de death or serious bodily injury to the officer or another person, to apprehend with a fleeing person for any felony that threatened or resulted in death or serious bodily injury if the officer reasonably believes the person will cause death or serious bodily injury to another unless immediately apprehended. While AB 392 arguably provides a greater opportunity to prosecutors to bring charges in police use of force cases, there is significant room for interpretation within those statutory definitions when prosecutors are making charging decisions. Ms. Lacey, how, if at all, has AB 392 changed your policies and practices related to charging police officers who use force in the time since its passage and how will it alter your practices going forward? Well, that's uh, a very good question, uh, Professor Colgan. We uh, studied the law quite a bit before it was passed and wondered how that would impact what we do here in LA County. I think the biggest uh, change that the law um, really has is with the fleeing felon rule. You know, there are some law enforcement agencies who already had policies that were consistent with 
you had to believe that the person fleeing was a danger to someone or a danger to the officer. And, and uh, th but there were some who did not. And so we're examining our cases very, very closely to see if in fact, uh, you know, what, how that will play out, how that will happen, whether, and, and, and there's a little bit of confusion because I know that there are some agencies that are training saying there's no change. It seems to me there, there is a change. We need to pay attention to it. But what I, I really hope is that uh, it will result in people taking a breath, let, you know, so that there are officers taking a breath so there's less loss of life that you won't see uh, the shooting like we did in Kenosha, Wisconsin, and that you will see people uh, exercise de-escalation techniques. I've been watching, and in the state of California, one case has been filed that I know of under the new statute, and that's in Alameda County. Uh, District Attorney O'Malley filed one case that puts, uh, that really is about uh, that law. So we'll, we'll be watching that trial. Okay, uh, Mr. Gascon, same question to you. Thank you, Professor Colgan. Um, you know, as one that worked uh, for several years uh, to try to get new legislation that would provide more restrictions around when a police officer can use deadly force, uh, I'm pleased to say that there has been, a, you know, new legislation. Uh, there are questions, as you well pointed out, as to whether this legislation is going to really take us into a completely different direction or whether we're still going to continue to, to struggle with some of the problems that we have uh, suffered as a result of police use of force in cases that were unnecessary. I do want to point out that there is certainly an underlying difference in the new law and one that I believe that will prompt different conversations in most police departments, I hope, uh, perhaps different training and certainly a different approach by prosecutors. And that is the introduction of the necessity uh, for the use of deadly force, which I think is something that many police departments had in their policies before, but they were not necessarily, uh, you know, because the law didn't necessarily talk about necessity, uh, that was not how police officers were viewed when they were being reviewed for potential, potential criminality in the use of force. So, my belief is that obviously this is a new law that is going to have to be tested and we will only know as litigation uh, and, you know, move forward how necessary will be uh, play a role in this new law. I'd like to give you both 30 seconds of follow up on that. I, I understand that the new law should have implications for training of police officers. What I'm interested in is whether it will have implications for the charging decisions your offices would make with respect to uh, use of force cases going forward. So uh, DA Lacey, I'll give you 30 seconds and then Mr. Gascon, uh, 30 seconds to you as well. Professor Colgan, I think it will because as, especially if we have evidence that someone was fleeing, I think I'll be looking more closely to see, okay, are they just trying to get away or was there a danger? And things like, did they have a gun? Was the gun in their hand or were they just carrying it? All of those things will go into the equation in terms of us reviewing these cases and determining whether an officer violated the law. But it's hard in a vacuum, you know, to, to, to really think about or explain what's going to happen in the LA County DA's office with this new law. Thank you. Mr. Gascon? Yes, I believe that there would be a different way of looking at these cases. I think that the exploration of what necessity means uh, is going to be central to the evaluation of future cases of police use of deadly force. And I can foresee prosecutors around the state beginning to have a very different analysis when they're looking at these cases. Thank you. Our next question is about qualified immunity. Qualified immunity is a judicially created doctrine that protects law enforcement officers and state and local governments from liability in civil rights lawsuits, including in cases of deadly and excessive force. The rule protects government actors from liability if their behavior did not violate a law that was clearly established at the time. To borrow from my UCLA colleague Joanna Schwartz's recent Washington Post op-ed explaining what clearly established means, in one case, the Supreme Court deciding whether to, is deciding whether to hear, Nashville police officers released their dog on Alexander Baxter, a burglary suspect, who had surrendered and was sitting with his hands raised. 
a prior decision in the Sixth Circuit had held that officers violated the Fourth Amendment when they released a police dog on a suspect who had surrendered by lying down. The appeals court ruled that this precedent did not clearly establish that it was unconstitutional to release a police dog on a surrendering suspect sitting with arms raised. Mr. Gascon, lawmakers could prohibit officers or local and state governments from raising qualified immunity as a defense. Do you support such reform? Yes, I do. And I think that it's important to first of all recognize that uh, when it comes to qualified immunity, it's primarily a federal issue. However, I believe that state law can definitely provide relief in the way, as I understand it, in doing my own research and talking to others, is that we can actually create new rights, as opposed to taking rights away from police, perhaps, create new rights for the public to be free from certain activity by the police that may infringe, infringe upon their constitutional rights or their right to be secure within their own persons. The state of Colorado actually has tried that approach already. Uh, and I know that there are conversations, and certainly we have been in conversations at the state level, to perhaps begin to explore how we can create a state legislative solution that would provide an avenue for the public to be able to have a more fair uh, evaluation of cases where they are being uh, perhaps unlawfully assaulted by police officers. Uh, Ms. Lacey, the same question to you. Would you support reform related to qualified immunity? I, I would, uh, but I want to be careful to make sure that it's for intentional acts or egregious acts, you know what I mean, as opposed to mistakes. So the example that you gave, where you have them releasing dogs on someone who's already complying and sitting on the ground, that would be one where I'd say, yeah, you, 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 know, you personally should be sued for doing that. But if it's an accident, they're following, you know, their procedures, their training, their policy. Uh, I could not see that being uh, something that I would necessarily support. I think with qualified immunity, the way it has been explained to me, and I've, I've not been in civil law. So I just want to tell you, I'm out of my, my area of expertise. Um, the reason people think it's a good idea is because it will deter police officers from acting criminally. And so if that's the way that law is written or structured, of course, I'm all for it. But if it's, you could lose your home anytime you try to protect the community, anytime you shoot, anytime you use force, uh, I would not be in favor of something that broad. So this is something I'm still studying. I'm still looking at it uh, because I've never been involved in, in any kind of litigation like this and would be the first to admit I do not have that expertise. Thank you. For our next question, we'll turn to the, inc the incidents here in Los, a Los Angeles following the police killing of George Floyd in Minnesota and Breonna Taylor in Kentucky. In Los Angeles, we saw numerous protests calling for reform to the city's criminal legal systems. While the vast majority of people who participated in those protests were peaceful, in some instances, property damage occurred to both public and private property. As prosecutors, you have near total authority to decide when to charge people with crimes. You also have an obligation to uphold the Constitution, including the First Amendment rights to speech and assembly. Ms. Lacey, under what circumstances do you think it is appropriate to charge people with offenses directly or tangentially related to protests? So I can, all I can do is really sort of share the decision, since I was the decision maker, right, in these cases. So with regard to unlawful assembly, failure to disperse, uh, there, we decided, I decided that uh, I wasn't going to prosecute people for that. But in terms of property crime, um, you really, with each case, it's unique. You really have to look at it. Um, if someone was, for instance, um, stealing a necessity, you know, that would be different. That would be something where you think about, let's send them to our, the LA County District Attorney's Office pre-filing diversion. But if they were running in and stealing things, um, you know, commercial things in order to resell or damaging property, I think the uh, DA's office has to respond because after all, those are victims of crime. Those are businesses. Those are people who are losing their jobs or losing their, they may be losing their livelihood. And so in those cases, we would file them, uh, but we would make sure that we looked at what's the appropriate sentence. So for instance, somebody with no record, 
we might be looking at probation, someone who has uh, a criminal history we might be looking at more time. But I definitely think that uh, it's one thing to protest, which I support, support per people exercising their First Amendment. But it's another thing to take advantage of police are busy over here managing protests and going in and uh, uh, stealing or damaging property. Mr. Gascon, same question to you. Thank you, Professor. I think first of all, it's important that, and I know that we're amongst lawyers mostly, but nevertheless, I think it's a good reminder that you know, the Constitution very clearly put the First Amendment as the one that, that provides the right for the people to peacefully demonstrate and express their grievances against government. And I think it's a sacred right that we as Americans enjoy. And as prosecutors, we have a sacred obligation to make sure that that is protected. And I would be very clear in ensuring that we are enforcing the laws, that we are careful not to trample on people's First Amendment rights. And I think sometimes, for a variety of reasons, we get a little carried away about, you know, things that may cause an inconvenience, you know, maybe a violation of curfew or blocking uh, egress or, or exits or, or streets at a certain time. And I believe that, you know, when our founding fathers created the Constitution, they never, they, if they thought the curfews were important, they would have put curfew on the Constitution, but they didn't. Having said that, clearly, if someone is not being peaceful and they're harming others, they're stealing, they're, they're using violence, they need to be held accountable. And that accountability obviously has to be proportionate to the circumstances of the case. Thank you. One possible reform receiving attention of late has been a call to defund policing, prosecution, and prison. Additionally, Los Angeles is facing a $935 million tax shortfall which keeps growing due to the economic crisis caused by the pandemic. Recently, the LA Board of Supervisors proposed that the budget for the Sheriff's Department, which takes up 40% of the county's general revenue, be reduced by 145.4 million, that the probation department be reduced by 49.1 million, and that the DA's budget be reduced by 22.2 million. Mr. Gascon, are these cuts too deep, appropriate, or not enough? And when or if the county emerges from the budget crisis, should those cuts be sustained? If so, where would you like to see the monies reinvested? Well, let me say that I think that we have to admit that for the last three or four decades, we have consistently grown the expenditures in our public safety budget, and we have done so at the, at the expense of public health, education, social services, and even simple services like fixing potholes. And we have done so at not only a tremendous financial cost to our community, but we have done so at a, at a tremendous social cost. We have gotten addicted to using the criminal justice system as a solution for every social ill, including mental health, substance abuse, and many other problems. I believe that the conversations that are taking place now are actually conversations that we started in my office in San Francisco when we drafted Prop 47, we intentionally went out to take money away from the Department of Corrections and put that money back into communities for service. So I believe that the conversations that are being having now at the county level should be the floor, not the ceiling. Obviously, we need to continue to explore as we're shifting services away from public safety agencies and putting it into other verticals to make sure that there are the appropriate responses on the other end. But I believe that this is a conversation that should continue to take place and that we should not be uh, complaining about it, that we should really understand that our communities are more likely to have more sustainable solutions if we start moving some of the solutions dealing with mental health and substance abuse away from law enforcement. Thank you. Ms. Lacey, the same question to you. Are these cuts on target or not? And how should we think of budgets going forward? You know, I um, have had such good um, success with the Board of Supervisors. I think they've done a phenomenal job as I've watched them over the last eight years in terms of how they balance the budget. And, and right now, um, I feel like the, the conversation is misdirected. It's not take money away from the police and move it to social services. It's can we get more money to social services? So right now, about over 22% of the budget is spent on social services especially for mental health. And I want, because I um, 
implemented uh, the blueprint for change or published the blueprint for change that spurred the board of supervisors to dedicate $120 million and create the office of diversion and reentry. Here's, here's the rub. When you say you're going to cut, uh, what are you willing to do without? So for instance, I think we'd all agree based on the last question about police use of force, we need body cameras on everyone that's out there, on every officer that's out there. But if you cut, you delay the implementation of body cameras. With, with the DA's budget, one of the things we were able to do uh, with the Board of Supervisors when they gave us some money is create the conviction review unit to create the human trafficking unit uh, to do a lot of things that the board was in favor of doing, the notario fraud unit, all of these things. And so when you cut, uh, what drives me a little crazy is when you cut, what are you right. willing to do with that? Thank you. Uh, while we're on the topic of prioritizing public funding, I'd like to discuss an issue of great public importance in Los Angeles, the housing crisis. In 2018, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights issued a report describing LA's Skid Row neighborhood as failing to meet even the minimum standards the UN High Commissioner for Refugee Sets for re Refugee Camps in the Syrian Arab re Republic and other emergency situations. Reform is desperately needed for those who live on Skid Row or otherwise have housing instability. And as one member of the audience pointed out in the submitted question, the business community is also eager for improved public safety and hygiene near their businesses. Ms. Lacey, in prior town halls and debates, you've pointed out something that many people don't understand, which is that the LA City Attorney's Office is in charge of many of the prosecutions of cases involving people who are homeless. But whether it be through an allocation of law enforcement and prosecution funding toward housing and social services for those people, or perhaps some other way that you think is important, does your office have a role to play in addressing LA's homelessness and housing crisis? Uh, no doubt no doubt our office plays a role. We can remove impediments. I think the hardest part, because uh, I've had a family member who was homeless and came back, the hardest part for someone who is unhoused or homeless is coming back, getting a social security card, things that you need in order to get a job, in order to get housing. And so I think as the DA, we dismissed about 900,000 old warrants to help the homeless clinic uh, get people housing. That was preventing people from getting services or benefits. I think what we're doing with uh, people who have a mental health issue through the Office of Diversion, uh, they've housed 3, 000, almost 3,000 people who would have been heading to jail or prison into what's called full supportive housing. I think the DA definitely does play a role. I have uh, played that role and we just have to continue to look for ways uh, in which we can encourage people uh, to, to get benefits, to get jobs. I, I, I do think that there are a couple of things that are outside of our control. Housing is so expensive in Los Angeles County. I don't know how anybody is able to afford uh, to leave home, to leave their parents' home. Uh, and so we have to look for more ways to get uh, affordable housing on board. And I also think we've got to get more health, mental health uh, you know, treatment for those who are out on the streets. When I walk along the streets, it seems like it's getting worse on Skid Row. We've got to figure out how to get people, how to encourage people uh, to receive help. Mr. Gascon, if you became the LA District Attorney, how would you uh, address the housing crisis? Yeah, thank you, Professor Colgan. I think first of all, um, I believe that one of the first things that a prosecutor should do before he or she makes uh, discretionary uh, decisions concerning a variety of the uh, of our, the variety of our work is to make sure that you almost think like a medical doctor and that uh, you think about do no harm first, right? You have to look at the actions that you're taking and look further down the line and see the ripple impacts of your actions. It's been said by the uh, by the head of the LA County uh, Homeless Authority to the New York Times that one of the greatest predictors of ensuring that someone would become homeless or houseless is sometimes a frivolous prosecution for a low level offense, which removes the person from their capacity to perhaps continue employment, pay their rent and, and ending up with an entire family uh, becoming homeless. I believe that is of the utmost importance to recognize that first of all, there are social and economic issues that are beyond a prosecutor's control. 
But in the areas where the prosecutor has control, we have to make sure that when we're making our interventions, that those interventions are protecting everyone and that we're not causing harm further down the line by those interventions. So when it comes to houselessness, we have to be very careful how we deal, how we deal with people that have, uh, that have ho housing insecurity to make sure that we don't compound their problems. You both have stated that you support the elimination of money bail, which is on this year's ballot as Proposition 25. While many support the notion of eliminating the unfairness caused when people with means can pay bail and obtain pretrial release, and those who are without funds cannot, a question remains as to what should replace that system. In particular, many have expressed concern that the use of risk algorithms, which may appear to be race and class neutral, will actually embed prior structural inequalities such as the disproportionate policing of black and brown communities into their algorithms. My question to you both is what steps you will take to make sure that your prosecutorial staff, when determining whether to support or oppose pretrial release, do not become overly dependent on algorithms? And what will you do to investigate whether the use of such risk assessments do or do not entrench inequality? Mr. Gascon, you may answer first. Sure. I, you know, in 2012, I was the first district attorney in the state and probably one of the first in the country, if not the first, that came out openly uh, against money bail. And the reason why I did so is because I believe that money bail has actually impacted our criminal justice system in ways that are unconstitutional. You are supposed to be innocent until proven guilty. But what we know that often happens to the poor is they're unable to post bail they are held in custody for sometimes quite lengthy periods of time without the capacity to, to provide for their own defense. And quite frankly, they're being treated as if they're guilty until they can prove themselves innocent. So I came out against money bail. I went out to work with the Arnold Foundation because I did not want to work with a for-profit entity in order to look for an alternative to money bail. And we brought in the PSA. It was an algorithm-based solution to money bill. And in San Francisco, we started implementing that and we saw a reduction in our pretrial detention. Having said that, I recognize that algorithms have also really bad impact because garbage in, garbage out. And my commitment has been to follow the judicial council model when we were under COVID for a period of time, begin with a presumption of release, ensure that all misdemeanors and nonviolent offenses are automatically released unless we have other concerns and look at violent crimes and begin to work with other partners in the space to have a creative form of evidentiary hearings to determine detention. And Ms. Lacey, how will you ensure your staff does not over, uh, over rely on risk assessment tools and how will you ensure there are, they are not entrenching inequality? Yeah, so I supported SB 10. I actually helped draft language uh, with Senator Herzberg, gave him suggestions and I'm really uh, hopeful that Prop 25 will pass and that we can really get on with it. Uh, right now, as we speak, LA County is looking at a risk assessment tool. I think the courts have decided on a particular tool, but I too will be looking at what are the questions? Uh, are we talking about zip code justice or are we really talking about dangerousness? Has the person appeared before? Uh, I think there are certain jurisdictions who say they've implemented bail reform, uh, but they've used the risk assessment tool and they've also demanded money bail. Uh, I think the case of James Humphrey, for instance, was very important. It said that you could not have excessive bail for people, and that's a case that is used in the Prop 25, um, the 25 commercials. So I'm going to be looking very closely. I have a very diverse uh, management team. I deliberately chose people from different walks of life, from different ethnicities, so that they can look at these risk assessment tools to see. Uh, but we won't know until the court actually gives us a copy, lets us know, examine. And like I said, we'll be looking for zip code justice, uh, anything that's racially biased that could, in fact, prevent someone who should be released from not getting released. Uh, you, you both referred uh, to uh, releases recently and what you've been doing recently. Uh, Los Angeles has been hit hard by the COVID-19 pandemic, especially the Los Angeles County jails. At the beginning of the pandemic, the population of the jail was at approximately 17,000 people on any given day, despite the fact that the jail's rated capacity is at just over 12,000. 
Ms. Lacey, in response to criticism by the Los Angeles Times, you wrote a letter to the editor in which you stated that shortly after the pandemic began, you directed your staff to identify people who could be safely released, which added 212 people to a list of approximately 800 people who did not pose public safety threats. You also stated, quote, in no small part due to our actions, our jails have done a better job of controlling the coronavirus than post pu most public institutions in the country. In six weeks, the jail population went from 17,000 to 11,900. Crime is down. The question to you is this. If the people you identified posed no public safety threat, why were they being detained pre-trial? Presumably, prosecutors in your office had opposed release in pers on personal recognizance in those cases. Right. So I'll never forget, March 13th was the day uh, we realized we were going, that the courts were closing down for jury trials and we were going to have to do something. So I made the decision to call all of my management team together and say, look, I know some of the people we release are going to commit new crimes. But the issue is, uh, are they crimes that are going to hurt people? Are they crimes where, where someone is going to get hurt? And that's the criteria. And so we went through, we received less list. We worked with the public defender and decided, okay, we're going to live with a certain degree of property crime right now because we are in a desperate situation. But we knew that property crime probably would not go up because you remember we were on all lockdown, safe at home. People were were home, businesses were closed. And so we made that decision. Now that said, uh, that was an unusual period of time. We, can, we will never have a period of time like we did March through say July where everything was closed. And so we're going to be looking at um, going forward, we're gonna be looking at the safety of the community because it's not just about Violent crime, you know, we've, we've had people who were out on COVID who continued to commit the same crimes over and over again because they knew we were gonna keep them. Now, eventually the public is not going to stand for that. You know, they're not gonna want the cars broken into and all of the things that uh, we were willing to uh, experience at that time. So we'll be looking very, very closely. Mr. Gascon, I'd like to ask you as well, your, your campaign website says that in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, you state that prosecutors should not oppose release from misdemeanor and certain low level felonies where there's no public safety risk. If there's no public safety risk, why not continue that policy when the pandemic is over? Actually, that's a great question because I think that that, that is a policy that I uh, mentioned when we were talking about, you know, getting rid of cash bail. Uh, I believe that we learned during the uh, period of time that we have the, the, the judicial counsel, you know, gave certain directions to all state prosecutors and courts. We learned that actually we were uh, holding on pretrial detention a lot of people that did not need to be held. Now, there are people that are going to be released, whether they're released on bail or they're released on their own recognizance that are going to reoffend. In fact, Many of the people that were released in bail in the past would sometimes reoffend. The reality is that there is no magic to money. Money doesn't reduce uh, dangerousness in one way or the other. So I believe that working under the presumption of release, especially for those that are nonviolent, uh, misdemeanors, uh, nonviolent felonies, I believe that it's a much better way to, to approach the work moving forward. I think that money bail has to disappear. And I don't necessarily think that it has to be completely replaced by algorithms that, that we are learning as we get smarter about this that can create other problems. So I actually think that the way to move forward in the future and the way of the 21st century will be to reduce our pretrial incarceration for people that are not violent and, uh, and we should continue to do the work that we started to do during COVID. It's, it's interesting that, that, um, that we just heard from, from Ms. Lacey about the idea of what the public will and will not want. Um, and that raises a very interesting question. In California, the people who are arguably most affected by the outcome of this race cannot vote in it. Because if convicted of a felony, people are prohibited from voting while incarcerated and while on parole. Felon disenfranchisement laws, including California's, have roots in the effort to prevent Black Americans from voting following the Civil War. In modern times, given unequal enforcement at all stages of criminal justice systems, these laws disproportionately prohibit people of color from voting. Further, studies suggest that the loved ones of those who are prohibited from voting 
their spouses, children, and other family members are also significantly less likely to vote despite not having been convicted. On this year's ballot, Proposition 17 would provide a partial reform, allowing those people in the community serving parole terms to vote. If that proposition is approved by the voters, it will restore the voting rights to approximately 55,000 Californians. The question is, does Proposition 17 go far enough? In other words, would you support an amendment that eliminated felon disenfranchisement entirely, allowing people to vote regardless of conviction, as is the case in the states of Maine and Vermont, and now also in Washington, DC? If not, why do you think preventing people from voting is an appropriate method of punishment? Mr. Gascon, you may answer first. Look, I mean, and I'm, I'm glad that you started, Professor, with a history of how this uh, this whole concept of disenfranchisement came out, because it's really, it was the vestige of slavery, right? We had a civil war, we ended slavery, and then we went about trying to figure out other ways to continue to keep the African-American community in slave-like conditions. So we created many laws, criminalized a lot of behavior, and then found ways to take people away from participating in, in the social and political systems of our country. It's a unique American thing. There are many countries that actually, even while you're in prison, you never lose the right to vote. In fact, there are places I would tell you that you don't stop being a citizen simply because you committed a crime and you're in prison. The punishment is the fact that you're being incarcerated. We should not punish any further. So not only would I support re-enfranchising all people that have been convicted of a crime. But I think that we should actually get to the point where you do not lose your right to vote, regardless of whether you're in custody or not. There is no direct correlation between the crime that you committed and your ability to vote and participate in the political process. And as you well indicated, usually when you have one of the, 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 the parties in the household that cannot vote, it has an impact downstream for their children and other people in the household. And it does disenfranchise big swatches of our community. Ms. Lacey, the same question for you. Would you support full elimination of felon disenfranchisement? You know, I, I find this conversation fascinating. I'm an African American woman. I, you know, I've studied slavery. I know what it's like to be discriminated against. And uh, and so I understand the argument. Uh, what I would, uh, I, first of all, I support that once you're out of prison, you should be able to vote. There's no logical reason for that. But I think that with regard to uh, when you commit certain crimes, certain felonies, that uh, you, sh you should lose certain rights, but not forever, but until they can be restored. I do think that uh, when you're talking about people who are doing uh, time for, for murder, for rape, for child molestation. Uh, I, I do not uh, believe at this time that those, those rights should be restored. I, 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 I love the debate about this because it does cause you to think about, okay, so uh, what is the rationale behind it? But I think there are certain crimes that you commit, and not all felonies, but certain ones that you should forfeit your right uh, to vote. In 2014, California voters approved Prop 47, which reclassified several felony drug and property offenses as misdemeanors. A recent study by the Public Policy Institute of California linked property, Prop 47 to a decline in pretrial detention rates, a drop in racial disparities and in incarceration rates overall, and decreases in racial and ethnic disparities in arrests and bookings between Black and white, but not Latinx and white people. Ms. Lacey, in your opinion, has the change of, has Proposition 47 been a success or a failure? And are there any amendments you would like to see to the legislation going forward? Well, I think in the, in the sense that um, it has addressed the issue of mass incarceration for people of color with regard to drugs, that part has been a success. Uh, I think what hasn't been a success is getting people more treatment. So for instance, uh, in San Francisco, there were 422 overdose deaths last year due to um, fentanyl, which is very easy, very potent. I really think that we should not allow people to die like that. I think we've got to get them help. So that's why when Prop 47 passed, our drug court numbers slashed. I mean, they went down to nothing. 
So we changed the criteria because it used to be with drug court, you had to have a drug offense. We went to look at charges that were related to drug use and said, let's get people help. Let's get people uh, into uh, treatment. Uh, the other part of Prop 47 is I, I, um, I'm hearing from a lot of small business owners that people who repeatedly steal are, 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 you know, are hurting their businesses because what happens is a misdemeanor means nothing in the LA County Jail. You can get booked on a misdemeanor sentence and almost be out um, in no time. So there's really no incentive not to continue on stealing from businesses. So I think there's some changes, but uh, I, I, I am a proponent for let's try to make it work. And I think here in LA County, we've, we've really worked hard to make the best of it. Mr. Gascon, you of course co-authored Prop 47. Uh, do you think it's been a success or a failure and, and what changes would you make? Yeah, I, it has been a resounding success. And I think the Public Policy Institute, as well as the University of California Irvine, have done in-depth analysis of the impact of Prop 47. And both have come to very similar conclusions. In fact, property crimes have gone down since Prop 47 was passed in 2014. And I find it very interesting that uh, Ms. Lacey talks about the, the death through fentanyl in San Francisco and somehow being attached to Prop 47 uh, because the reality is that we've had death from fentanyl going up in this country everywhere and Prop 47 is only a California phenomenon. But, you know, frankly, LA County actually per capita has more death due to drug overdose than San Francisco does. So I'm not sure what the, what the, uh, the, the relationship here is. I think that the reality is that Prop 47 was designed intentionally to do what it did. And I know that because it actually started in my office. We were very intentional about going after the incarceration of black and brown people. We saw the disparity in our prisons and our jails, and we wanted to end that. And when you're talking about property crimes and the thresholds between a felony and a misdemeanor, which I think was implied in the conversation that I heard earlier, we have states like Texas that has the threshold between a misdemeanor and a felony is $1,500. The reality is that Prop 47 was barely adjusting from inflation. And we see now an attack on Prop 47 that is certainly not based on the numbers. Uh, Ms. Lacey, I'll give you 30 seconds in rebuttal if you'd like to explain the, the uh, data you provided around San Francisco. Right. Um, the data provided, um, just to sort of explain it, the article I read said there was open air drug dealing. Basically, the drug people who were uh, dealing to the folks who were on the street were not being punished. In other words, the police were arresting them several times and then there was no consequence to dealing. As a result, people were coming in in order to sell drugs. That, that's the, the connection. The connection is, is once you say, okay, you can deal drugs, don't worry about it. You'll get arrested, you'll be out again and, and you can continue to profit off of someone else's misery. You're going to continue to see people die. Mr. Gascon, you may also have 30 seconds. Thank you. I think that, uh, you know, we're listening to some level of disingenuousness here. I mean, the reality is that Prop 47 does not touch possession for sales of drugs or sales of drugs. Those continue to be felonies. But what we have had is we've had an epidemic in this country of death by overdose that is not unique to California because we have had a problem with drug use and big pharma has influenced this process for many, many years. And just advancing the concept that putting people in concrete boxes to deal with their addiction, I think is wrongheaded. By addressing low level nonviolent felonies, Proposition 47 arguably dealt with the lowest hanging fruit in California's criminal system. But empirical evidence suggests that mass incarceration is largely dr driven by increased prosecutorial charging in more serious felony cases. And that further to address mass incarceration it will be necessary to reduce sentences for serious violent crimes. Mr. Gascon, are there serious violent offenses that carry long-term sentences for which you would, be, would support a reduction in sentence length in order to address California's mass incarceration? If yes, which ones and why? If no, why not? Look, the, the reality is that the utility of extreme lengthy sentences does not provide any more safety for our community. We, in the last several decades, have added enhancements over the base sentence, and we have 
sometimes multiply and, tri and triply uh, the impact of sentencing for many crimes. And we haven't really done anything that actually creates more safety. So I am a big proponent, as I was a supporter of Prop 57, which actually allows uh, people that completed their base sentence and they're uh, rehabilitating inside the prison system to be able to be released. Uh, I am a big proponent to continue to reevaluate, you know, reevaluate and evaluate the utility of lengthy sentences, understanding that there are many people that we have in prison right now, they are in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, and they are still in there, and they're not posing any safety risk to us, but we're paying millions of dollars to keep these people in prison. So, yes, I believe that we need to actually roll back to where we were about 30 or 40 years ago. This has now not always been the American system. In the early 70s, we incarcerated at rates similar to other industrialized nations in the world. By the year 2000, we have completely thrown the system out of, out of kilter. And the answer to your question is, there will be many ways that I would look to reduce the impacts of enhancements in our sentencing schemes. Uh, Ms. Lacey, uh, Lacey, the same question to you. Are there any serious violent offenses for which you'd be willing to support a reduction in sentence length? You know, that's a hard one for me because when I listen to um, wealthy people theorize about, ah, you don't need to send people away for prison. We need to let the mur people who murder out. I think to myself, well, they're not coming to your neighborhood because you live in a very protected neighborhood. I grew up in LA in the Crenshaw district where crime was a real concern. I thought everybody had bars on their windows and doors. I did not realize until I went away to college that people lived a different way. Uh, I believe in proportionality. I preach that. Our policies preach that. We don't send everybody away for the maximum. That's a fallacy. We divert those who are nonviolent. Uh, we have a pre-filing diversion program. We have all kinds of alternative sentencing courts. But when you hurt someone, I got to think about the victims and I got to think about the safety of the community. And uh, this is where I think uh, with regard to serious and violent felonies, you hurt someone, the DA has got to be in there uh, looking out for the safety of the public. Look, we have a great public defender. We have a great alternate public defender. Uh, and we, they lead wonderful offices and they do a great job of advocating for their clients. But the DA has to put victims first and has to put the community first. Uh, the Los Angeles District Attorney's Office is one of the largest in the country, both in terms of the number of prosecutors and in terms of the geographic area covered. This can result in wide variation between how prosecutors ma managing particular regions approach charging decisions and engage in plea bargaining. As a result, two people accused of the same offense may be treated very differently in one area of the county as compared to another. Ms. Lacey, what steps can you take to improve geographic disparities in treatment going forward? You know, uh, Professor Colgan, I, whenever I, a defense attorney tells me, hey, when I, I get one uh, sentence here and another sentence here, I ask them, have you appealed this up the chain of command? Because we have a written appeal process where if you think that someone isn't getting a fair sentence, uh, you can appeal up to a director who is over all of these different agencies. So there are ways to do that. Uh, we also routinely look at sentencing to make sure that it is consistent. The problem is, is that sometimes no two cases are alike. No two people's uh, criminal history are alike. And so oftentimes people will compare apples to oranges without really looking at the individual case. But if anybody feels that way, they really should appeal up uh, the chain of command and a director will review it, a head deputy will review it. And oftentimes I find that people complain, but they just don't uh, necessarily, first of all, um, do the appeal process, but also do the work necessary in order to get the lower sentence that they want. And Mr. Gascon, uh, what steps will you take to ensure that there's not disparate treatment and charging plea bargaining around LA? I think there's, there's multiple things that I would do. Number one, I think that you have to do the, take a hard look at the structure of how the office is managed and ensure that there is uniformity of the way that we look at cases across the county, quite frankly, even across the buildings. You know, there is often conversations about what you get in one floor could be very different on another. I think that 
part of that would be training. Part of that is, you know, written policies and then, you know, scrutiny and, and uh, you know, and just creating good, uh, you know, good measures of accountability. Uh, when I was a district attorney in San Francisco, we created uh, dashboards that we use very clearly to track our performance across the office. And I understand that San Francisco is a tenth of the size of LA, but the principles of use of technology to track work and performance and be able to evaluate uh, if you have outliers within the system is one that applies. In fact, I would say that it applies uh, more so to larger organizations. So if I were to be elected DA, uh, we would be uh, leaning very, very aggressively in the use of technology to begin to track our work, be able to, by the way, also be very transparent about it so that the public would have access to that information and continue to learn and move forward in a way that creates more uniformity across the country. After years of scandal regarding inhumane conditions and poor rehabilitative outcomes, Governor Newsom has signed SB 823, which will result in the closure of the Division of Juvenile Justice, or DJJ, which is the state's juvenile prison system. This reform creates at least two potential unintended consequences, and I'll ask, ask you about those consequences one at a time. The first is that counties do not necessarily have a place to provide appropriate facilities or programs to ensure youth who otherwise would have gone to DJJ receive the educational, mental health, and supportive services they need. This is particularly true in Los Angeles, where the juvenile jails have been found by the Office of the Inspector General to routinely use pepper spray and other types of physical force and verbal harassment against youth, and, uh, uh, and as well as other forms of misconduct. So Mr. Gascon, as DA, how will you address that problem as DJJ is closed? Look, I think that first of all, we need to begin to, to ensure that children are treated as children, right? And that, uh, you know, we need to move away from having lockup facilities that really are a carbon copy of the adult facilities. In San Francisco, uh, we moved to a very aggressive restorative justice models um, and it worked really well for us. And the reason why I know that it did is because we actually brought in researchers, we had control groups and we compared uh, both the restorative justice model and the traditional juvenile system. And we saw tremendous improvement to the point that before I left, about a year before I left, there were members of the Board of Supervisors that created a task force that decided to, by 2021, close uh, the juvenile hall in San Francisco, which I supported, and create smaller settings for those uh, young people that perhaps need to be in custody for a period of time. The bottom line is that we need to move away from thinking of juveniles as adults. Uh, the brain hasn't been fully developed and certainly the traumatization that takes place in our juvenile halls and the, the, the adult-like conditions that, that they're held, uh, we need to move away from it. I support A23. I agree that there are some unintended consequences, but I don't believe that that is a reason not to move forward and continue to work in collaboration with all the stakeholders to make sure that we get to a different place in our juvenile system. Ms. Lacey, the, the same question to you. So what do we do with a 17 year old who commits murder? What do we do with a 16 year old who molested another child? What do we do with juveniles who commit very serious crimes and who do need mental health counseling and do need more support? So those Juveniles, they're going to shut down uh, the state facility and send them all over to the county. And so L.A. County probation is going to be responsible for that. Remember, uh, Professor Colgate, in a few questions uh, in the past in this debate, you said the board wants to cut their budget. So what is going to happen? Where is that money going to come from? And how are we going to make sure? that when these juveniles go back out into society, that no one else is victimized. So the issue is much more complicated than, oh, let's just close down Juvenile Hall. You know, there are some people who argue that uh, close down Juvenile Hall, where are kids going to go? You're going to ship them outside of the city. They're going to be put somewhere far because the truth of the matter is, is when you have people who are, um, who are a danger, you're going to have to deal with that. You just can't close your eyes. That said, we're part of uh, a working group, uh, Alternatives to Incarceration, and we're looking at the juvenile justice system to see. And we've made written recommendations to the board about how we could go about 
uh, doing something when the juveniles come in order to make sure the public's safe and they're rehabilitated. Both of your answers lead to my second question, which is that another potential unintended consequence of this reform is that prosecutors may be more likely to use the power they have under California law to charge youth as adults. So beginning with you, Ms. Lacey, will this change your office's approach to charging youth as adults? Or Not at all. That going forward? Not at all. Um, there, you know, the, over the last 12, um, eight years since I've been DA, and even before I got to be DA, we saw what's called direct filing go away, where you immediately could file uh, on juveniles as adults. So we're seeing, first of all, the juvenile population in LA County has been cut by 50%, at least that was before COVID. It's probably even more than. We talked about releasing adults. We also released a lot of juveniles. And so I think that that would be unjust to overfile in order to get uh, uh, a juvenile into uh, prison. We're gonna to continue to do what we're doing is being very, very selective in terms of who we think uh, should be treated as an adult and not adjust our policy. If this is what uh, the state is deciding to do, we're gonna lean heavily on making sure that while they're in county custody, they get the treatment, the mental health, the substance abuse, whatever they need in order to safely go back into society. And Mr. Gascon? Uh, look, I don't believe that a juvenile or, you know, children should ever be prosecuted as adults. There is no question that there are sometimes children that commit horrendous crimes and they are dangerous and they have to be dealt with accordingly. And sometimes they are not going to be capable of being released into our society in order to protect ourselves and others and themselves. Having said that, the way that we approach juvenile justice needs to be contextually different than the way that we deal with adults. And sending children into adult prisons has always led to bad consequences. You know, children, when they are set up in an adult setting, they become victimized immediately. Um, they do not get any better. They go there for very extended periods of time. And often their criminalization continues to grow as they get older. So it's important to understand that if someone is dangerous, they need, to be deal, they need to be dealt with accordingly and the right level of intervention may be that you have to be removed from society at that moment. But treating children as adults is never going to be the right answer. And as far as I'm concerned, if I were to be elected, there would be no 707 transfers, children would be, would be tried, they will be dealt with through the juvenile system. During this campaign, much discussion has focused on the origins of contributions made to both of your campaigns. Both of your campaigns have received significant donations from organizations or individuals outside Los Angeles County. The distinction, very roughly speaking, is that outside donations from, to Ms. Lacey's campaign come from entities related to law enforcement and prison guards unions, and donations to Mr. Gascon come from entities associated, uh, entities or individuals uh, who fund progressive causes. Apart from the fact that criminal activity does not stop at the county's border, and so how public safety is addressed in Los Angeles has implications for public safety statewide, another reason that people from outside of Los Angeles may have an interest in this race relates to how state prison systems are funded here in California. In California, if the prosecutor in any county obtains a conviction that results in a state prison sentence, California the taxpayers statewide foot the bill. For years, because LA sends more people to state per capita than 70% of, uh, of California counties, that means that Los Angeles taxpayers have effectively received a windfall. There is a concern, however, that by disassociating the cost of incarceration from the county, prosecutors have less pressure to think critically about their charging decisions. Mr. Gascon, would you support legislation that requires counties to fund the state prison system at the rate at which the county sends people to be incarcerated within that system? Actually, Professor Cohen, I'm smiling because this is a conversation that we had multiple times in my office when I was a district attorney in San Francisco. And we started having conversations about how do we get the past state legislation that counties be forced to pay uh, for state prison, and we joked around that we would we knew that that would immediately have an impact on incarceration. Uh, in the case of San Francisco, we were a net contributor to the pot, mainly because we're a very rich city and also because we did not incarcerate as many people. So I do believe 
that it is important that actually we shift the burden of paying for that to the county, just take that money away uh, from the counties. If you want to incarcerate, they should pay for that. Uh, I know that you talk about also the conflicts of interest concerning um, your you know, money coming into different campaigns. Uh, the reality is in my campaign, the, the campaign itself, the funding is coming from very grassroots. Our average campaign contribution, I believe, as the last report is under $100. Now, there are people uh, that have been investing in criminal justice reform for many years. They have invested in organizations that are supporting uh, my race. Uh, but it's important to understand that these are people that actually care about the work. And as you indicated earlier, the cost of the criminal justice system in LA impacts everybody else in the state. It's not something that stays within our borders. And if we're gonna be very punitive and we wanna incarcerate a lot of people, then we in LA should pay for that. We shouldn't have other, other counties pay for that. Ms. Lacey, the same question to you. Should Los Angeles put the bill for cases in which prosecutors obtain prison sentences? You know, I don't want to speak on behalf of the taxpayers. I think that is something that should be decided by them. But I want my prosecutors focused on justice. I want them focused on what's the right thing to happen in order to protect the community. I want them totally focused on uh, the defendant, the victim, what's the harm uh, to the victim and safety and things of that nature, which you really can't put uh, a cost on it. So I, I'm not um, uh, uh, sure that involving the DA in that is the right decision. That said, uh, we always have to be con cognizant of resources. I mean, how much time is a trial gonna take? Those types of things. But I want the main focus to be on justice. Let's talk about contributions. The men and women in law enforcement are um, supporting my campaign and not directly to me, uh, but in what's called IEs, independent expenditures, because they work and live here and they want to make sure that residents are safe. I also think that I have uh, am a fair prosecutor. People know that uh, what they get with me is not a politician and it's someone who's going to make the decision uh, based on the facts and the law. Um, with regard to people who are investing in criminal justice reform, I think you have to ask yourselves, are they going to live with the consequences? Are they going to live with the experiments that they're wishing to put on LA County? And I just don't think that's a wise thing to do. In 1988, California enacted the STEP Act, which prohibits participation in any criminal street gang and provided sentence enhancements. A determination of gang involvement can carry additional penalties of between two and 10 years in prison in some cases, and an indeterminate life sentence in others. Further, suspicion of being in a gang can result in people being subjected to harsher treatment by law enforcement during what might otherwise be a routine interaction, such as a traffic stop. In 2016, an audit of the Cal Gang database which at the time contained over 150,000 names of people suspected of affiliation with the gang. The audit showed that the database was riddled with errors, including that 42 people were identified as suspected gang members at one years of old or younger, 28 of which were entered with the designation of having admitted to being gang members. More recently, over the summer, news broke that officers in LA's Metropolitan Division were falsifying information on field cards that are used to populate the database. And a report by the Office of the Inspector General found that the Cal, Cal Gang database was haphazard at best. Ms. Lacey, my understanding is your office is already reviewing cases involving the specific officers involved in the falsification of reports. Beyond that, did your office change its policies regarding charging offenses under the STEP Act in 2016 when problems with the Cal Gang database were made public? If not, why not? And are you doing anything now to ensure that past convictions are reliable beyond those cases involving the officers at issue in the falsification scandal? Thank you. So we charge those officers uh, with falsifying the FI cards. You know, with the gang enhancement, uh, the LA County District Attorney's Office has realized that you have to be very careful when you charge it and that you need the right evidence. In other words, you don't just rely on cal, cal gangs. We more often will rely on documented history, self-admission, those kinds of things in order to prove our case in court. Um, we do not exclusively and never have exclusively relied on cal, uh, cal gangs. Our position is trust but verify. 
uh, with regard to going forward, uh, now that we have discovered a lot of these things, we've been doing them for doing this for a while. We're reviewing all those cases that the officers are involved in. We've already dismissed seven of them because we've lost faith in the officer's testimony and lost faith in those cases. So we are going through and doing a, a review. Uh, we continue to always improve our training, always look for ways uh, to give our lawyers more instructions. But here in LA County, we have a gang problem. We have a gang crime. Uh, problem. And we've got to make sure that we don't just let the gang members keep the community under siege and that we do what we can to punish the gang crime. Uh, that said, we are extremely careful with how we use the gang enhancement. And it should only be used if the person was in fact committing a crime on behalf of the gang and for the benefit of the gang. Mr. Gosco, and how would you address gang-related crime and violence in Los Angeles? And, and please include in, in your answer any specific reforms to the use of gang enhancements or to the DA's hardcore uh, gang unit. Yes, so I've uh, actually made a, a public commitment uh, not to use gang enhancements. I, I've completely uh, become convinced that the data that is being used often for this, uh, this type of enhancements is so corrupted. Uh, we have seen evidence over and over again, beyond what we have seen with Metro uh, recently. We know that there are many other examples of the, the problem with uh, young people, usually young people of color, uh, being identified as gang members, or sometimes even not so young. We have seen cases of people, um, you know, even in their early 30s, being identified as gang members just simply because of the clothing they wear or because they happen to be in a rap uh, uh, group. Um, so the reality is that in order to deal with organized crime, when you have you know, gangs or any other organized type of crime, there are many tools that we can use to make sure that people are held accountable and they're held accountable proportionally to, to the level of their criminality. We, I believe, do not need to necessarily identify people in the community as gang members. I don't think that is a necessary tool in order to deal with crime. And as I said, if you have organizations that are working in, con you know, they're working in, in concert to commit organized crime, then we have the tools to deal with that. In 2010, the United States Supreme Court decided Padilla versus Kentucky, in which it held that defense attorneys have an obligation to provide competent advice to their clients regarding the possible immigration consequences of their cases so that people can make a knowledgeable decision about whether to plea or proceed to trial. In response, and in light of the serious consequences that even a criminal charge can bring, regardless of guilt or innocence, to those who do not have citizenship, California's legislature passed Cal Penal Code 1016.2 and 3, which require prosecutors to consider the avoidance of adverse immigrant con immigration consequences in plea negotiations. Mr. Gascon, how did you address this requirement as San Francisco's DA, and will you make any changes to those policies or practices if you're elected? Yes, so we did several things. So one of the things that we did in San Francisco is that we actually uh, provided training to some of our supervisors in order to make sure that the lead agreements that we were striking would entertain uh, immigration consequences. We also worked with a public defender to make sure that everybody in the space was working together. Because as the courts indicated and our own statutes have now, often immigration consequences actually provide consequences that are greater than what a person would face for the same underlying crime. And we wanted to make sure that it was a matter of equal protection under the law to entertain uh, immigration consequences uh, during our work. In a county as large as LA, if I were to be elected DA, one of the things that I have agreed, and actually it's an idea that came out of a group conversation, is that we would create an immigration unit. What we would have is a small group of immigration lawyers that would help our trial attorneys make sure that when they're doing their work, they are aware of the pitfalls of immigration consequences, because many times even defense lawyers may not be familiar given that this is a space in the law that is very different than criminal law often, and frankly, it's, it's, it's ever moving. So I think it's uh, critically important, especially in a community like LA, where we have about a million undocumented immigrants in LA County, which impacts many families and many communities, that when we do our work, again, we that by doing our work, we're not actually leading to the deportation of families or family members. Uh, Ms. Lacey, what policies and practices have you developed to ensure that your staff comply with the requirement to take into account immigration consequences and plea bargaining? 
You know, LA County is a well sought after office because we, we lead the way on so many different issues. This is one we've led. Even before I came, became DA, the prior DA, uh, Steve Cooley, implemented a collateral consequences policy where we could take into account uh, someone's immigration status in fashioning um, a sentence. Uh, we've actually, I've actually put forth legislation uh, to make some of our policies law. We haven't been successful in that, but we've put those forward. But more recently, there was a change in the law uh, wherein uh, we could go back and resentence someone who has sentenced a long time ago and didn't realize that at the time with the current climate that they could be deported. And so we have training policies on how to um, get that relief to the people who need it, who may have thought, gee, at the time I pled, this wasn't an immigration issue, now it is. And, and one further thing, I even went a step further, the law originally when it was passed said, well, you had to be in danger of being deported. I said, no, 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 the climate is such that someone could be deported. So we're gonna be proactive about it and make sure that uh, those who feel that they are in danger of being deported over old sentences can have those sentences redone and prosecutors can take the lead in that. Right, we have time for one more question before closing arguments. Uh, in Los Angeles, low-income communities and communities of color are often live near industries that create environmental threats, disproportionately affecting the health and well-being of those residents. Uh, Ms. Lacey, can you explain how the role you see your, the Environmental Crimes Division in taking in supporting uh, communities of color that's, that uh, have these issues? Right. So oftentimes as a prosecutor, when you first join the office, you think you're going to be doing murders. You think you're going to, you know, I've been in court. I know why I joined. Uh, but we do have an environmental crimes uh, division and they uh, are part embedded in a group called the Environmental Justice Task Force. And we're specifically talking, looking at uh, different environmental justice issues. Uh, we looked at Exide. Unfortunately, with Exide, the feds took that over, but we looked at it to see if there was something we could do. Exide was a battery uh, plant company uh, where uh, children of color were living around all of this lead that was being deposited. So we're very embedded in that. Uh, we have an environmental justice task force, and we look for ways, look for cases. We've prosecuted uh, some cases of illegal dumping uh, and uh, uh, transporting hazardous materials on the, um, on, the, on the freeway, on the roadways. And so we're very, very active. Our group is, is uh, very committed uh, to making sure that people obey the law, that they, don't, uh, you know, that they don't use communities of color, like the one I grew up in, uh, to store uh, or, or do things that will harm uh, the residents there. So our, our unit is very, very active and has had a lot of success in at least identifying and addressing some of the issues of environmental hazards. And Mr. Gosson, how will you approach environmental justice issues? Yeah, I think that the, the whole area of environmental justice is, is a problem, especially in a county like LA, which is one of the most polluted counties in the country. And when I was endorsed by the Legal Conservation Borders, we, we have very clear conversations about the problems that we have with, you know, improperly cap, uh, abandoned fossil fuel wells, uh, the impact that those have in communities, uh, the impact that industrial polluters have in our county, and quite frankly, sometimes the lack of accountability in that area. I believe that part of our work as a prosecutor is to ensure that we're protecting our community from all types of threats. And the reality is that environmental pollution is one of the biggest threats of our generation, not only because of global warming, but the impact that we're seeing. We have entire communities where there are unexplained cases of cancer. We have communities where young people have unexplained respiratory problems. And many of those scientists will tell us directly correlated with a lot of the the pollution that we have in our environment. And in California, prosecutors have great tools to deal with this work as well. Quite frankly, there are many members of our com legal community that would love to be able to assist in this work uh, in LA County. So if I were to be elected district attorney, this is an area that I would put a great deal of effort in. Thank you very much. Uh, it, it actually appears we do have time for one more question. I'm going to sneak that in if, if we can. Uh, so uh, on, with respect to defense rep, uh, uh, representation, 
In Los Angeles, the Board of Supervisors purport, proposed budget cuts uh, and has recommended $26 million in cuts to the public defender and the alternative public defender's office, which outpaces the $22.2 million in proposed cuts to the DA's office. Uh, Mr. Gascon, in light of the dangers that the underfunding of indigent defense representation causes to both people who are innocent of the crimes for which they are charged and those who are not, do you support the, the board's decision to make larger cuts to the public defense budget than to that of the prosecution? I do not. Uh, and let me tell you something, because I think it's important for people to understand that the prosecutor is always going to have uh, a large body of work that public defenders are going to be engaging in, right? Including, you know, public defense board and, you know, cases like environmental justice, police accountability. So there, there's a lot of work that goes on, you know, public corruption that goes on in the DA's office, but the public defender does not play a role. Having said that, I believe, and if I were to be elected, I would be working with the public defender's office and the alternative public defender to make sure in the workspace that we are together, that there's proportional funding for that work. I think it's critical to the fair administration of justice that the defense be funded equally to the prosecution and that work where we share the space. And Ms. Lacey? Well, I've actually advocated on behalf of the public defender to get more money. So for instance, when we started our mental health work, uh, they needed uh, psychiatric social workers. So I've actually written a letter advocating for that. And as a result, they now have 10 where they had none. APD, alternate public defender doesn't have any, but we'll be advocating for that. So I've actually advocated for that. Look, I was a courtroom trial lawyer. And in my opinion, the system works best when, when the defendant is well represented and when the prosecutor uh, is, is, is equipped and understands their goal and mission of justice. It's an adversarial system for a reason, right? And so um, I believe that uh, with regard to the public defender, if they justify that they need this money in order to represent indigent defense count, I mean, uh, in, uh, people who are indigent, I'm all for it and support them. I have a great working relationship with our public defender and our APD. And with regard to the cuts, I mean, uh, in some sense, Mr. Gascon is right. We handle more cases, but let's say there's more on the line for them. And I want to make sure that every defendant has a fair trial. I want to make sure that everyone is represented by a lawyer who's ready, who's equipped and ready to go. So uh, I, I support a lot of the things that they're asking for and in fact have helped advocate uh, for more resources for them. Thank you. At this time, we're going to turn to closing arguments. Uh, our, both of our candidates will have three minutes uh, to give a closing argument and we'll begin with Ms. Lacey. Yes, I am... Um, really excited to be again amongst my colleagues. Uh, I knew this was gonna be a different type of debate because you know, when we're debating in front of the public, we're not gonna able to be able to talk about all of these policy issues because the public may not understand it. But the truth of the matter is you all live and work here in LA County and, and you deserve to have the best person representing you in the courtroom in the DA's office. I have tried over a hundred felony jury trials. I tried the first hate crime murder case uh, and got the first hate crime murder case conviction in the state of California. I've tried everything from uh, the lowest level drug cases to murder to uh, uh, and everything in between. Uh, as DA, as the first African American woman to hold this position, I have done my best in order to make sure the DA's office gets better. That's why I created the human trafficking unit, the conviction review unit, uh, and change the Brady policy, which we never really got into, which allows us to give more information, not less, but more information uh, to um, defendants to make sure that they get a fair trial. Uh, our mission statement is that uh, we pursue justice in a fair and ethical manner, but we also safeguard crime, crime victims' rights. And it's important. You just, you can implement reforms, but if you forget about the abused woman, if you forget about that child that's molested, if you forget about that family that's mourning the death of their loved ones, then you really do a disservice and you encourage people uh, to continue to victimize our community. I want our community to be better, to be safer. I wanna make sure that uh, if we implement reforms that we don't see 
our, our community deteriorate. I don't want businesses to leave. I don't want people to be afraid to leave their cars outside. I don't, I don't want any of that. I want uh, safety in Compton. And I want that same safety that, that you have in Beverly Hills in the Compton neighborhood and in Watts. And because of that, uh, I have been very, very deliberate, as you all know, because you're all lawyers, in looking at reforms, reading the fine print, studying it, and thinking two or three steps beyond what the language says to see what that is going to be. So you have a choice, and this is a crucial time in our, uh, in our, our discussion on criminal justice reform. But I really believe that most people care about safety and victims, and they want justice, and those are not mutually exclusive. And so if you elect me as DA, I'll continue to implement the reforms that I started, particularly with mental health. I'll help with regard to homelessness on this mental health issue and uh, continue to do the best, make the decisions that are in the best interest of justice. And I wanna thank the Beverly Hills Bar Association for this wonderful opportunity and a wonderful opportunity to discuss the issues openly and frankly. Thank you very much. Mr. Gascon. Thank you, Professor. You know, the, this is a defining moment in our community as it is a defining moment in our nation. Uh, we're being faced with existential questions about our nation. In many ways, we're being asked existential questions about where does the criminal justice system move in the 21st century? The choices are going to be between the past and the future. We can continue to do business the way that we've done for the last 30 years. We can continue to incarcerate people uh, at disproportionate rates because of the race or because of their economic status. Uh, we can continue to have police use force in ways that they're not held accountable. Um, we can continue to harm our communities and continue to destroy budgets and destroy communities by the way that we do the work. Or we can begin to look at a 21st century model of law that would look at how we built as opposed to break. How do we rehabilitate as opposed to punish? How do we bring redemption to our system? How do we redefine the term criminal justice? How do we redefine safety? You know, the term community safety has been defined often by people other than our communities. And it's a conversation that is being had today and is being had often on our streets. And we will be foolish not to pay attention to that. The reality is that I have been endorsed by many. And the reason why I'm being endorsed is because people that are looking at this very closely have determined that I'm the better candidate. The LA Times did a wonderful editorial explaining why they were endorsing me. The Daily News, the local Democratic Party, as well as the state party. Three US senators, hopefully one of them will be our next vice president. The mayor of LA, the governor of the state of California, the Speaker of the House. I can go on and on and on. Many of the major clubs in this county have endorsed me. And the reason why they have, because they have come to the conclusion that this is a time for change. It's not a time to continue to look back, it's a time to look forward. I am really honored for the opportunity to be with all of you here today. I also wish all of you safety and health. We are at a crisis in our nation. We are seeing family members, we're seeing neighbors dying, we're seeing people suffering. This is unprecedented times for us. This is a time for leadership, and this time's called for a different kind of leadership. And I believe that I'm a better candidate for it. All right, thank you very much. Before I turn things back over to Adam, I would just like to add my thanks uh, to the Beverly Hills Bar Association for allowing me to participate in tonight's event as well as to both of our candidates for a thoughtful and informed debate. It was uh, lovely to uh, actually uh, be able to engage on, in the issues with you. And I think we've provided an example of how debates can go. So thank you all very much. And Adam, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Professor Colgan. Uh, I join with my colleague uh, in thanking both of our candidates, DA Lacey and DA Gascon, for such an enlightening debate on vital legal issues. Uh, as reflected in the attendance and questions at this event, you are certainly keeping the voters engaged and informed, and you both helped me to think about these issues in new ways. Uh, I'm a civil litigator, but you helped me to think about them, and I appreciate that. To continue the conversation, viewers can contact the campaigns using the information that we posted on our screen. 
I would like to take now a moment, especially to thank our moderator, Professor Colgan, for her informed and thoughtful questions. Professor, you, you covered a lot of ground in a very engaging way. My only request is I, I hope that the uh, exam will be open book. <laughs> I, as you can see, I'd, I'd also like to take a moment to thank our co-sponsors who are posted on the screen. It's very important that we acknowledge, recognize, and include all of our co-sponsoring bar associations and all the voices that they represent. Finally, I'd like to thank all of you, our members and viewers, and I would encourage those of you who are lawyers and not yet a member of our bar, please join us. We can, there's many ways that you can join at many levels, and you can help us put on more events like this. So please take a moment to review the information, and I hope that you will join us as we move forward into the 20, 2021 and 2022 time period. And finally, um, let me just say to all of you, D.A. Lacey, D.A. Gascon, Professor Colgan, and all of our viewers, thank you for attending. Be well, have a good evening, and most importantly, remember to vote. Thank you all, have a great evening. Thank, thank you. you, thank you all.